Welcome to the Dirty Side of Leadership podcast with Ron and Kristen, where leadership meets entertainment. This podcast features stories with names and certain aspects that have been changed to keep submissions private. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Dirty Side of Leadership podcast. We have another exciting episode for you. We are going to discuss the controversial topic, should we ditch dress codes? We first want to thank those of you who have supported us. Please tell others about the podcast, rate us, subscribe on YouTube and Rumble, and don't forget the forward high performance planner. It's available on amazon.com. Do not buy your 2024 planner yet without checking out this one. Ron, should we ditch the dress code? Oh, wow. Well, let's not go too fast. Um, (laughs) Krista makes me dress up for the podcast, even though it's a podcast. (laughs) No. (laughs) Okay, so I, I think in this regard, here's what's happened, and this is what people tell me as I travel. People got accustomed to working from home, and then they reconstituted, And even on the days, let's say someone's working at home two days a week, going to the office three days per week, they hate to dress up now. So I think we created, you and I have talked a lot about the after effects and the collateral damage of COVID and the lockdowns, but this is another residual effect uh, coming from COVID. I don't think it was as controversial pre-COVID. So anyway, um, I have a long history, Kristen, with dress codes, and I'm going to tell another story further down, but I wanted to share this with you. So I was on a school board for a Christian school. My daughters were in private Christian school, and they put me on the school board for a while. And just when I came on, they had the big vote on whether or not kids should wear uniforms. Mm, mm -hmm. At the time, there was a small Christian school that uh, where I grew up, and, and it it seemed that the kid were, kids were impoverished. So I just kind of had a negative connotation of dress, you know, school uniforms. Right. Well, so I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm voting this down. Kids need to be able to express themselves. So I they began to give us research. I did some of my own research, and I began to look at all the benefits of school uniforms. Mm. And I literally did a 180 by the time I finished researching. And this is why I tell people, you can't attach your heart. You can't apply ownership to something, or you're always going to be biased or tainted. you got to take an objective look at what the research says. And in right. this case... It was pretty overwhelming. And let me give those to you before we get into other types of yeah, dress Yeah, this code. is interesting. Yeah, this is school uniform. And mm-hmm. I got this part from Nord uh, Anglia, and it's a, like an international school. So they mm. do tons of research. And their research revealed that school uniforms created cohesion, made people feel one, reduced the potential for bullying. And I'm not 100% sure how that does you know, reduce the chance of bullying or the potential for bullying. But I guess it's looking at someone in a degrading manner, the way they're dressed. That's one of the ways that that I thought maybe. Uh, Improved study ethic. And I didn't understand it either, but think about how much time. And I I am going to have to bring out females because it is just a known fact. They spend more time getting ready in the morning than than a boy. (laughs) When I was in school, you know, I'd mess up my hair a little just put on my clothes and out it's not a lie i can tell you that so <laughs> think about the productivity and the time that's invested in picking out dresses and pants and shirts and makeup and all this mm-hmm. stuff takes hours so anyway uh then it's a fair dress code you can't have the rich kids looking down upon the poorer kids um right it does minimize peer pressure everybody can't be walking around with a tommy logo and all that stuff It prepares you for the outside world. There's many jobs. Uh, My daughter Jansen and I joked because she went to private Christian school, wore uniforms, and now she's working uh, in a profession that she wears scrubs. She's back Mm, in uniforms. So we got to laugh even about this episode I was talking to her about. (laughs) She can't get away. She can't get away. Um, And easy mornings for uh, students and parents. Now, the cons, just quickly, they can be expensive, and that's true. But there was this co-op where everyone brought their used clothes and people switched you know as your kid gets older if they didn't wear it out yeah and uh, i think that helped a lot of parents uh this is the biggest argument and this is what a lot of people will say that it limits Mm self-expression at first when i read that i thought well maybe it does but then i thought there's got to be 
plenty of ways to express yourself, not just right. in your clothing. So right. I think that's kind of a small thinking. Right, um, I agree. And then they might be sexist. And that part is true because even before I left as a federal probation officer and went to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, there was still one judge that would not let females wear open toed shoes and they had to wear pantyhose. And pantyhose were kind of oh gone. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and, we uh, had to wear those at the bank for quite some time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I do get it could be sexist, but we'll talk. We're always solution-minded, yeah. right, Kristen? So right. we'll come up with some things on this podcast. And then it might lead to more policing of students, and that is very true because I remember one time my, my oldest daughter, Haley, had her shirt untucked on one side, and she got written up for it. So there were some uh, strict rules on that. But wow. overall, I believe the pros outweigh the cons, and I ended up voting to institute school uniforms. Yeah, did it get voted in? Yeah, yeah, it did. Nice. So it actually went through. Yeah. yeah and did you have course, much opposition? Yeah, there was opposition at first, and yeah. and I don't mean this negatively. It was it was school mothers. Dads didn't, you know, they didn't care either way. Yeah. yeah. But there were some mothers upset. But a year later, no question, they realized right. it made their life easier. I could see that. Yeah. You know, sometimes that you know you got to at the end of the day you got to look at that. So what's yeah. your thoughts on it? No, I, I actually, I could see the pros and the cons also. My kids, as everyone knows, they are homeschooled in a homeschool group. So there's like 50 other kids and we do not have uniforms. But I will say getting out of the house in the morning on the one day that we actually need to go to community school, um, <laughs> getting my son dressed is the biggest argument we get. I'm like, can you just put your shoes on? Can you put socks on? It's like... I don't know. I'm I'm assuming the dress code didn't in, include shoes, or maybe it did. I don't know. But but I could see how it would make life a little bit easier. But if I was a, a female in school and I had a dress code and I had to wear a skirt every day, I would not be thrilled with that. So as long as there's pants available for females, yeah, I would be okay my, with it. Where my daughters went to school and they they could choose. They could wear the slacks also. Females. That's could. nice. <clears throat> yeah, because who wants to? Yeah, yeah. Just there's some negatives to that. So, no, I think that's great. And it all makes complete sense to me. Uh, I, I want to think, let's think outside of, now that we've just talked about school uniforms, because I think that that really lays the foundation for what we're talking about here, um, the pros and cons. And I want to start with an important workplace. <laughs> this has been in the news quite a bit lady, lately, and that's the United States Senate. So, Understandably, there historically has been a strict dress code, but recently the Congress had issues with its own dress code over the past few weeks. I would say probably maybe even a few months. John Fetterman shows up wearing like cargo shorts and a really oversized sweatshirt. And I, I don't even know what he's wearing on his feet, but really is showing up pretty schluppy. And I don't care what political party you represent or you're from, that, in my opinion, is that is unacceptable. You look like a schlup and you're in a, at a position. Uh, I was looking into the why behind it. And a lot of people are saying, well, he's, you know, he's like, to, I'm looking back at what you were talking about. Students wanted to express themselves. He's expressing himself. He's trying to align himself with the blue collar folks he says he represents etc. But there have to be boundaries. And I feel like when we, I agree that in the, the U.S. in the workplace that we need to revisit the dress code because like it or not, the pandemic changed a lot. Now, I'm not saying folks should be able to go to work in yoga pants or gym shorts, but I think um, uh, maybe g denim, nice shoes, and a button-up top should be acceptable, right? And so, but when we're talking about the U.S. Senate, if you cannot bring yourself to dressing appropriately, then you, you shouldn't be running. And you think about, if you look at what's happening, Ron, in, in England, I mean, most of them, they still wear the wig, and a lot of those traditions are still in place. And we have someone, how embarrassing, we have someone coming in, looking like they're homeless. I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on that? 
think we're getting embarrassed a lot, it seems. Um, yeah. So going back to Fetterman, there's also people who say, well, he had a stroke and that's reason. And there's no correlation between nice clothes no. and, and, you know, enhancing a stroke um, situation. So I, I don't buy that. Now, I thought it no. was interesting that both sides of the aisle agreed on this one. Um, there was a controversy stirred up that there was a picture of Ron, uh, Rand Paul. He's the senior senator from Kentucky. And it had Rand sitting on the, the steps outside the Senate with a red bathrobe and no shoes. And, it, and it, I really did have to commend him. I'm thinking, well, that's, that's how you send a message and protest. Statement. But it turns out we do our research, don't we, Kristen? We don't just throw yeah. anything on this podcast. So I researched right. it, and it turns out it was AI-generated. So Rand probably regrets missing Created. that opportunity. But right. uh, Oh, gosh. That's He's him right me. now. He's calling me. <laughs> I told him to never. Exactly. I told him to never call me when I'm doing the podcast. But anyway, uh, that yeah, I'm, I'm glad I that researched that. So, so Kristen, along with your point, and we'll zip through some, through some other things, but yeah, with your point, when you were kind of reassembling the dress code, I agree with you. But here's what happened to us. So, I worked in the federal courts. Not only did you work court, but we had to go out. There was. Uh, the supervision unit had to go out and supervise offenders. And that's the stuff that most people know about when they talk about probation. They don't know the other aspects. So we had people under supervision and I worked in a rural area. Sometimes you're climbing hillsides to get to someone's house. And this judge there, we had relaxed the dress code and it turns out there's a female who ends up wearing blue jean shorts to an offender's oh house. Gosh. The offender commented on the shorts in the female, uh, as offenders tend to do, oh my goodness. basically that she looked hot in those shorts, and it got back ultimately to the judge. So the judge then restricts everything and puts us back to business professional, so mm. we had to wear a suit and tie oh out gosh. in the communities and neighborhoods. So they know you're either wow. Jehovah's Witness or you're you know you're with law enforcement, one or yeah, the other. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. So uh, that is kind of what happened to us so yeah I, I think when you start to relax dress codes you, you better have very clear boundaries or you're going to have right. that one person who's going to show up naked or show up in a wife beater or something and they're going to blow it for everybody it's like the episode of the office was like casual friday and angela is like wearing like a half shirt and little booty shorts and then she goes to adjust her shirt to cover her stomach and her boobs pop out and it's people casual friday went wrong where i worked on occasion also i mean so you're right it is this this balance where you're hoping that people can be professional but it's just not gonna it's not gonna be that easy and so i don't like what that judge did because to me, that's that's like the, the lazy approach is to paint everyone with the same brush instead of just going to the one person who made the mistake and addressing that. Uh, there's better ways to do it. It might take a little more work, but um, that's really it doesn't make sense to to get everyone with it. But um, yeah, it, it's disappointing. And, you know, Ron, we've had we've had that at the bank where and that can be some of the most uncomfortable <laughs> conversations that you have when it comes to dress code, yeah. especially if you know somebody financially is struggling, but they're coming to work with maybe holes in their pants or unfortunately it's a conversation that has to be had regardless. And, you know, going back to Congress and, and we're, we're, we agree that it's unacceptable to dress that way. But, um, you know, if, if we allow someone like that to start dressing like that, you know, the next thing that's going to happen is, well, I'm overweight. I don't want to wear pants with, uh, you know, anything but elastic, right? Or or somebody's just going to, ah, we're not going to wear bras to work anymore. We're just going to let them flop around at work. Or It can get really out of hand. If we start accommodating every little thing, it's, it's not going to be pretty. So yeah, we need you, to get it in check. You have to look at the lowest common denominator for sure. And yeah. I think it's interesting, Kristen, like I said, both sides of the aisle, but Congress did pass a resolution formalizing the dress code. So we'll have to see what John Fetterman wears to work. Oh, my goodness. he's not going to be wearing a hoodie anymore. Yeah, I'd like to see what, what actually happens because I don't, I don't see 
a lot of correction these days, a lot of accountability. So are you fined? Like football players, baseball players, they get fined if they're late for practice or if their uniforms aren't worn properly. They can find large sums of money. Yeah. So what's going to happen to someone like Fetterman who abuses that? Are they actually going to get fined or is something going to happen? I guess we shall see. We shall see. Yeah. All right. Let's get into the workplace, Kristen. Yeah. So talking about dress codes in the workplace, it's important because it creates a long lasting impression. We always say the first impression is a lasting impression, right? I'm sure there's other sayings that, that you're aware of, Ron. What do we have there on first impressions? <laughs> I know you've got a few up your sleeve. Well, you only have one opportunity. <laughs> you only have one right. opportunity for a first impression. It's true. It's true. So if you're going in the business where you're, you have clients especially, that is, that is a huge piece right here for anyone listening. If you are client-facing or your business is client-facing and you have employees or yourself that's going to be seen by anyone outside of coworkers and leaders, that is a completely different ball game. You need to make sense or make sure that you are dressed appropriately and professionally if you are in a client facing environment. Because not only could it give a, a, a really poor impression for the client, but I mean, it could go as far as where they just drop you because if you don't look like you are professional, then they're going to assume that your entire business is not going to be able to live up to the standards that they desire. What are your thoughts on that? No, I totally agree. Kristen, when I walk in a place, I, I, <laughs> I put an ABC rating uh, on things and I'm like, oh, this is a C business. Uh, mm. You can tell by the way people are dressed, if things are clean, if they're not clean. Yeah. Uh, I took a picture the other day. I was in McDonald's and there was lids everywhere. And mm. uh, I took a picture of it to use as a, on a post uh, just to show uh, what that looks like. And, um, you know, it seems like when people get really busy or let's say they're making money, they don't care. And, right. uh, and look, this is not McDonald's per se. This is whoever is running that particular restaurant. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's leadership. It's always about leadership. And Kristen, I always think about your mother. You've got me now. You know, I've been living in airports and I look yeah. at how people are dressed. So I always dress pretty nice at the airport. And sometimes I even wear my, a, a suit jacket. And you would not believe the difference on how I get respected. Uh, when right. I dress that way, if I'm in blue jeans and a T-shirt, uh, I get treated a little bit of a different way. And that's mm -hmm. that's a choice you have to make. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's just true. So one time right. I had meetings in D.C., so I wore my full suit. And it just so happened my procurement specialist was going on that trip just for a couple of days and she was flying back. So we were sitting uh, together on the plane and um, the senator from South Carolina or with Governor Mark mm -hmm. Sanford got on the plane and. There's a whole cool story about him and his uh, uh, situation. He fell in love with a woman in Argentina and ran off, and they couldn't find oh, him. Wow. It's, yeah, it's a crazy story. But back to the point. He's walking on the plane. I'm about midway back. And he said, hey, how you doing? He shook my hand. So he goes on back, and she goes, my God, do you know everybody? You know Mark Sanford? And I just looked at her, and I just pulled up my tie. And she said, what? I said, trust me. This is what he shook hands with. And I dropped my tie. And she said, oh, you're the only one dressed up on the plane. And that's oh, what it was. That's why he shook my right. hand. Right. See, I see it as you respected yourself and therefore he respected you. Uh, I don't I don't think a lot of people go that far. When Ron referenced my mom earlier, you're talking about how she said everyone that you can see in the airport is also they can see you. Right. Yeah. So yep. we do a lot of people watching in airports. Most people do. And um, they're all looking at you, too. So don't dress like a schlup at the airport because you I, never know who you're going to meet. I am just stunned to think you're going to sit beside of someone looking like that. It's just bizarre oh, what yeah, people, people wear. Are, I yeah. mean, people are in pajamas. They were in. I, I wanted to go. Is this a sleepover? Did I miss the? Seriously. All right. It's let's a, zip through these. Kristen, it's a bad get us situation. going. All right. So. Levels of professionalism. So the dress code is always relative to the company's given industry. I wanted to go back to something because you mentioned restaurants, and this is something where I take a lot of pride in how I dress. But one of my jobs was at Izzy's Pizza, and it was big in the Northwest for a while. The, the disappointing thing is we had uniforms, but they did not give us enough. 
I had to wear the same one and I would just be washing it every single day. And naturally when you work in a restaurant, your, your clothing gets tattered and it smells, even though you can wash it, you still smell like the food there. And so if you manage a restaurant or own a restaurant, you need to make sure your employees are given, if you want them to wear your uniform, give them enough uniform shirts. Tell them Kristen. Yeah, seriously. And I, I mean, I, I had, remember looking schluppy, and it wasn't my fault. I was washing what I had. I bet you had coworkers that didn't wash it every day as well. No, so. and it stinks. <laughs> I can tell you that much. If you work anywhere where there's a fryer, that is like this layer that you cannot get off of you. Um, yeah, it's it's nasty. But anyways, yeah, that that's one thing where, unfortunately, some people just aren't outfitted properly. And it reflects poorly on them, but they're very limited on what they can do with it. Yeah. But, um, okay. So going back to the dress code. Okay, so the dress code is always relative to the company's given industries. We're talking a little bit about that. There's a big difference between restaurants or, say, a bank, for instance. In blue-collar jobs, like construction sites, it's a must that workers wear safety gear, right? Uh, there can be a whole bunch of violations and, and issues if they don't. So the same principle applies to jobs in other industries. So occupations in the business and financial industry, like myself, for example, uh, should be dressed in formal wear in order to identify them as a formal place of work. And I'll tell you, I put in place Blazer Friday. So everyone that worked for me, w the reason for this is we saw the most clientele on Fridays. And so for me, I wanted to make the biggest impact I could from a professional standpoint. And so I implemented that my team would wear a black blazer or whatever blazer they wanted to wear, but it was Blazer Friday. And we got so many compliments that everyone looked very professional and it reflected in our customer service scores. Now, when you roll out a dress code like this, you have to make sure you give enough time. I gave two pay periods for my employees to go and purchase a blazer. So you have to do something like that. You have to be thoughtful about if you're implementing a dress code, you need to be thoughtful on timing and how they're going to be able to afford what you are implementing, okay? So that's piece of it. So you heard it, folks, when everyone else was dressing down, Kristen was dressing up. I was. I like it. No, I'm, sure that, did, I'm sure that did get attention. So, yeah. uh, and Kristen, I, I wanted to mention, we did do some research from Crim Code, K-R-I-M-C-O-D-E, and mm -hmm. several other resources, including some notes that I had. Uh, but yeah, number one is those long lasting impressions. And if I right. walked in and somebody's dressed up on a Friday, that would speak to me. And, right. uh, and it does speak to people, whether they even know it or not. It's that, it's that initial first impression they get, right. they build a image of you in their head and that's what they're going to remember. It's so true. I have to share it. This past weekend, I was at the Oregon Cattlemen's Association. They put on a big shindig in uh, Eastern Oregon. So we drove out there and I knew that there was a, it was like um, a cattleman's ball. But when I asked for the dress code, because generally those are very dressy. When I asked for the dress code, it was like, oh, you know, it could be just like casual. And so for me, I'm like, I don't want to risk it. If I'm going to be one of the speakers there, I want to present myself as such. And so my friend and I dressed really nice, you know, black cocktail dresses, and we showed up. And yes, we were some of the most dressed up, but there were plenty of men there in suits. So you had, you had a wide variety of people that just showed up in denim. Um, and then people like us that showed up and were wearing actual like cocktail attire. And I felt so confident and so happy that that was the choice we made because it did stand out and we were taken seriously. You know, Kristen, it's so interesting you said that. I've never come back from anything saying I wish I'd dressed down. I right. have come back before and exactly. wished I'd have dressed up, but I've exactly. never wanted to dress down. Right. All yeah. right. Number two, it highlights professionalism. And we've pretty much said enough, but I want to say this. Right. If, if there are business owners that are listening or CEOs or whatever, you may or may not have, have the flexibility to alter um, you know, the dress code. But keep in mind that you may be in an environment where a dress code is not appropriate. That, that's up to you. We're giving you some highlights and some reasons that dress codes can work and right. uh, create efficiency and so forth. But it does 
promote professionalism, especially mm-hmm. if you are in a professional environment. Could you imagine if you walked into a bank and the bank manager walked out looking like Fetterman has got a hoodie and, oh and shorts and Kristen, when when I got promoted to academy director, we wore uniforms that had U.S. courts right on there. And mm. um, but I gave the option that you wear the uniform or business uh, casual. Right. Which means you had to wear a collar. So some of the instructors chose to do the business casual. Most Mm -hmm. liked the fact that they had uniforms because, you know, a team environment. But I chose to dress up simply because in the Federal Law Enforcement Academy world, if you are C-suite, if you're in the upper echelon, everyone wore suits. I would have been the Mm. only director not doing it. And I realized even when I went into meetings, you almost look subordinate to the other people Mm. if you're in your regular shirt and they're in a suit and tie so yeah. I, I, i'm not saying i always wore a tie but i always dressed up i had my jacket ready and there were a lot of times and especially in dc i wore a tie for meetings so yeah uh, you got to know your environment know the climate but just know this mm-hmm. you get one chance at a first impression what's number three Kristen? establishes reputation and rapport and it's really important to understand when employees mingle outside of work and they mention that they work for you, people may get an idea of what your company is all about just from looking at what they wear. So that's big. This is outside of work. Again, you are always representing your company. So that's really important. A lot of people don't really think that way. If you're going to talk about where you work, you've just represented your company. So this aids in a lot of of networking. So if you're networking outside of work and you're dressed like a schlup, then that's what they're going to think about your company. What do you think about that, Ron? I I agree. And isn't it cool when you meet someone who believes in their mission, like they're proud of their company? Yes. And uh, it's it's really cool to me when I hear that. And I do get that sometimes. I get people who say, yeah, I love working there. And this is why. And I just think it's a great thing. And it's rare. We should see that more often. It is rare. Let me just tell you, I, you know I have strong opinions and beliefs on things. I met some, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail just in case they listen to this podcast, but let's just say I met a couple and when they were talking to my husband and I, and this is about four years ago, uh, they were very negative about what they did for a living. Both of them were in the same industry, the tech industry, and they were both just speaking so poorly of their jobs. They hate their jobs. They hate their boss. I was so turned off. I never, ever accepted an invite for dinner or drinks or anything again, because you don't want to surround yourself by people that are just really negative and cancerous like that. You want to be around winners. And if you don't like your job, do something about it. Move on. Don't don't complain. Uh, That really was was nasty. Have you done that before? Oh, yeah, I've been around tons of people. And it used to be a cool thing, like the jock male would always belittle the company or, you know, they're smarter, they're better, they're all this. And as I, you know, began to just open my eyes and and look at the negativity, I realized I don't want to be like that person. You know, they may have their little following and it may sound cool, but I don't want to be like that. And then, of course, when I kept getting promoted and I I realized you get a whole different viewpoint when you're the head of it, something versus you know, you're you're further down the ladder. And I realized, right. oh, my God, I even regret it. I'm sure I said some negative things before, uh, not as a habit, but I'm sure I made comments. And I, I regretted that when I began right. to see, man, it's a different level. It's a different yeah. viewpoint up here. Oh, it definitely is. All right. Number four. And this is my favorite, Kristen. So favorite. I plugged it in. Um, it shows it clearly states employees are on the same team. That's why I never wear red at Target because they always think I work. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, the, let's talk about a loose dress code. I'm like wearing this sloppy red sweatshirt. I'm like, oh, I guess because it's red, that means you're good. Okay. I don't really go there. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I uh, I was uh, one time I was there several years ago. I kid you not. I didn't even think about it, but I had this red shirt. And uh, I had two people come up to me at different points asking me where something was. And I thought it was hilarious. And I started to pretend I was the manager. You know me, Chris. And I started to run Target. Um, (laughs) No, this is what happened. So I mentioned earlier to put a conclusion on the previous story about I chose to wear suits instead of the uh, uniform shirts. But it was interesting to me that I had a couple negative people. And, of course, 
they chose to wear the the dress clothes simply because they were making a statement to the other team members I'm not part of the team, you know, I'm not going to be like you. I'm cooler than you. I'm better than you. But yeah. when I weighed it all out, you can't prove what someone's thinking. Yeah. And as long as they wore the right attire and they weren't making comments, uh, then, you know, I had to let that ride. There's only so much yeah. you can do. Right. But when people are wearing the same clothing, you are making a statement that, hey, we represent this company. We all work here. Right. And, um, of course, what you do with it's up to you, but it's still you're in uniform. You know, it's like right. the military. It's like the police. It's like, you know, fire people. It's it speaks something to uh, the community and, and right. customers and, and people in general that we're on the same team. Yeah, it, it sure does. And no, I'll, I'll go into number five here. It also, well, Kristen, it, I'm so oh, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. No, There's a fine. study. There's a study. Yeah, on, let's on do it. The. Uh, the enhances credibility. Mm, yeah. Um, there was a 2014 study. I thought this was very interesting. 128 men of different backgrounds, they, they got them for a social experiment on clothing. They were divided into three groups. One wore suits. The other was in the clothes they showed up in. And the rest were dressed in sweatpants and T-shirts. <laughs> These men were partnered with a neutral group to test their negotiation skills. Of the three groups, excuse me, the first averaged a much higher deal for their companies. So no matter what people say about it, people might make comments. Those people who are dressed nice landed more deals. Isn't that interesting? That's, that really is. And I'll tell you what, I don't know about, about you, but even if I've, I've been, I worked from home for three years, I would make myself you know, I could have been working in yoga pants and a sloppy t-shirt, right, when I didn't have video calls, but I made myself get up and get ready just like I did when I went to the office. And, you know, denim and a nice button-up shirt, a smart shirt. But um, I did that because I felt I operated better when I was dressed as if I was at the office. Chris, and I want us to hit entrepreneurship more in the future, but I will tell yeah. you something. When a new entrepreneur asks me for advice, that's one of the things I tell them. Dress to go to work in the mornings. Yes. It's absolutely. a mindset. It's a mindset. Especially when you're, yeah, when you, an entrepreneur, you have to drive yourself. And um, that is that is huge. And that's the first step. Get up, get dressed as if you're going into the office. Yep. Um, all right. Jumping into commands, respect here. Respect, as we all know, respect is not given. It is earned. But in order to earn it, one must establish that they deserve it. Dress codes make managers more identifiable to subordinates, showing that they have the authority to make decisions and the skills to guide the rest of the team. And going back to the first point, um, there is something about professional wear that gives employees impressions of their leaders. And even psychologically, employees would probably not be interested in answering to somebody in sweatpants and flip-flops. Yeah, very true. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you talked about something earlier, Ron, how it was with the uniforms at school and really the simplification of it. And I think about Steve Jobs. He had, though I, I don't love how he dressed, <laughs> the same, he wore the same mock turtleneck, right? Little mock neck. He wore the same black turtleneck every single day. I believe the same denim. He did not the exact same. He had probably 200 of each, but he did that because he said it was a waste of energy to yeah. try to make a decision on what to wear. And I have a friend, Chris Jones, just in case he's listening, amazing head coach um, of, he was with the CFL. He's been with the CFL Canadian Football League for a long time. He was with the Cleveland Browns for a little while, but head coach, general manager, and he does a similar thing where he's always wearing a black shirt and he's always wearing black slacks. And And he had quoted Steve Jobs also for his rationale for it. So there, there could be something to it, though I will not be traveling down that road. I think those mock turtlenecks are called Dickies. If you, you <laughs> no, that's when, it, that's when it cuts at the chest. Those are coming back. Dickies are coming back. Are you going to get one, Ron? <laughs> Bring Dickie back. That's my motto. <laughs> I think of Christmas vacation when he's wearing like a forest green. It's the Uncle Eddie. He's wearing a forest green Dickie underneath a white V-neck sweater. And you can see the whole oh, outline. God. You're killing oh, me. Oh, my gosh. That's like the best movie. Oh, 
All right, number six, it instills productivity. And uh, it yeah. basically is a mindset that you're saying, I'm dressed to work. Like, okay, my free time, my casual time's over. Now it's time to go to work. And I can see, uh, you know, some people, especially I think Gen Z a little more, they don't like the formal dress wear. Right. But as long as it's done in a, in a wise way, in an equitable way, it does send the message that we are at work. And I think sometimes yeah. the line gets blurred because we want that work-life harmony, that work-life balance. Mm -hmm. But there are times you got to turn it on and work is work. I mean, right. I know that, you know, we, we talk a lot about we want people to be happy and we want them to be fulfilled and all of that. But the bottom line is at the end of the day, they pay you to work. Right, exactly. Yeah, I completely agree. It, I, it does that for me. And that's why I've mentioned, even when I didn't have to, I did. So yeah. it goes far. Yeah. Um, visual uniformity, this is number seven. Uh, this is similar to the concept of teammates. Having just one employee show up in ultra casual attire can throw off the entire mood of the workplace. So when everyone is on the same page about what they can and cannot wear, it also increases the unity of the team by establishing that uniformity. And what happens, Ron, I mean, you, you've managed teams. What happens when you have set in place a, a dress code and someone doesn't adhere to it? If you don't address that as the leader, you're going to have people that are either, they're either going to be repulsed by this person dressing up like a schlup or they're gonna start doing it themselves. And so a few episodes ago, I talked about how I had an employee who I had, I had just told everyone, no drinks visible to clients on the line. And he, he, it was a Saturday, so I guess he thought rules didn't apply. He had it out there and I reminded him of it. And you know what, Ron, I don't always like to be the micromanager, but if I didn't remind him that I had just set those expectations, what would that have said to the other four standing around watching him do it. They oh, would have absolutely. slowly brought their drinks right back onto the teller line and I would have lost respect for not enforcing what I inspect or what I expect of them. That's what I was gonna say is you definitely are gonna lose their respect, but you're right on both exactly. fronts. The other people would have would have started doing it as well. Totally. Yeah. I'm guilty of that. When a manager sets an expectation, uh, when I was like just starting out in a low level job in my teens they set an expectation. If they don't inspect it and follow through on it, you're going to start bringing back old behaviors that they have told you they don't want to see. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's just human nature. You're going to push boundaries. And Chris and I went in these notes and added a couple. So I'm not sure what number we we're on. This is eight, eight. or nine. Eight. Well, I actually think I did number one up there. <laughs> so, no. yeah. Um, anyway, it boosts confidence. And it's almost human nature across the board. If you look good, you feel good. Right. And when you have employees dressed up, and it's not like you talked about where you give them one uniform and, and there's strings hanging off of it and it's worn out. Yeah. Uh, if you give them uh, nice uniforms, it usually builds to their own concept of professionalism. They think, wow, mm -hmm. I've joined an interesting team here. They care right. about their employees. I've got new uniforms. And, yes. you know, we talked before, swag still means something to employees. It totally does. It, it does. I, I told you I was over this National Wellness Committee, and the first question they had when I sat down, I think we were in Chicago, they said, uh, what's our budget on swag? And I'm like, what? <laughs> I wasn't That's expecting so that to be the, out of the gate. Yeah. So, uh, you, you know what you just made me think of? I have an event coming up on October 21st. We need swag bags for all the people that have purchased tickets. <laughs> Yeah, they love that stuff. Yeah, and I, I've talked to my assistant and Chris and you and I've talked a little bit about this, but I'm going to get some swag for Ford operations. Um, love it. I just got to figure out, you know, what's really really cool. Chris, yeah. what's the verdict here? What have we? What hmm. have we? What's the conclusion we've drawn? Well, overall, dress codes get a bad reputation for being too restrictive, but they give fr employees the freedom to choose what they wear and what it isn't going to do basically okay in a nutshell it's really important that employees see having a dress code 
<laughs> Ron's laughing at me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm laughing. I, I started reading from the notes, and I'm like, what is that saying? And you went, okay, in a nutshell, I love it. I know. I'm like, Good this job. doesn't this doesn't work for me, so I'm going to have to move on and do my own thing. Sometimes but, research is misleading folks. Yeah, I'm like, I don't, I don't love this. But, um, yeah, basically, dress codes serve a purpose. You have to... You have to have thoughtfulness behind when you put a dress code in place, but that they do serve a purpose, and I am pro, I am for pro dress code ultimately. But I do agree that it's 2023. We went through a pandemic. A lot more people are working from home. I mean, that's an understatement. The vast majority of folks that can are working at least hybrid. And you have to revisit the dress code. I don't see anything wrong with smart jeans. And when I say smart jeans, generally it's a darker denim and they are they don't have the holes. I don't care if it's fashionable. They don't have that. It's a darker denim and then a, a button up or some type of professional shirt. Um, not a t-shirt. It needs either a collar or button up. And I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. You know, Kristen, there's some tech people who... You know, they believe in their very casual environment. And, and I think they're right to some extent. You know, you got to know your own environment because some people aren't as respected now, especially mm-hmm. in that tech world. If you're wearing a suit, they might think you're some oddball. The key right. is, is don't let it go too far. Don't have body parts hanging out that don't need right. to be hanging out. Uh, right. Be wise. And this is what I say to new young, young entrepreneurs. They might think they're being so cool to do this relaxed environment but it almost always comes back to bite you so even if it's a relaxed dress code you still want to be very specific just like Kristen just did what type of slacks what type of jeans are we talking about right and I think as as long as you're specific that you that'll work but in situations where you have a uniform I think we've concluded that it can really boost that professionalism. It creates a team. It makes people, right. you know, they don't have to worry about what they're going to wear all the time and it helps them prioritize life, really. So right. if you are an employee and you have to wear a uniform, wear it proudly. Don't be that person right. complaining about it all the time. Look sharp. Yeah. It'll pay off. One of these days right. it's going to pay off. Be sharp. Be concise. Be professional. Right. And uh, things, will, uh, things will go your way. Yes, I'm in 100% agreement with you. I know I was always overdressed versus underdressed, and it went far for me. I've received a lot of compliments, and it boosted my self-esteem. Customers actually really appreciated it in the bank, and I know they do in many industries. So don't wear a hooded sweatshirt to work, please. No no kidding. And if you're still listening, Chris and I so appreciate you. Uh, We may not say it enough because, you know, we're always focused on content and getting a good podcast out there. But we are so grateful. There's been so many people that are dedicated. Chris and I got some messages last week that I just haven't had time to share with you. Mm -hmm. But uh, they meant a lot. And uh, people are listening and they're checking us out, downloading. Uh, And if you can continue to help us, uh, we want this to just get better and better. And yes. uh, we're getting out there in the hemisphere, as they say, the, uh, <laughs> the world of nice. podcast. And, uh, you know, it's, it's moving up. So let's keep the momentum going. Yes, absolutely. I'm very appreciative as well. And I, I know when I met a lot of people at, this weekend out in eastern Oregon, I was able to share with them the leadership podcast. And the cool thing is when you go rural, this was very rural. These were, like I said, cattle ranchers mainly. They took a poll and asked everyone to raise their hand who was self-employed. And 90% of the folks there were self-employed. Wow. Entrepreneurs. It was amazing. And so those are the folks that generally will invest in themselves and listen to podcasts. Not not always, not just limiting it to that. But uh, when you own your own business, there's a lot more on the line. And so you have to do a lot more investing in yourself. Yeah. I got a phone call this week or last week from uh, a leader, a government leader. And um, anyway, had reached out, wanted to talk. We set up a phone call and she said, First and foremost, I love your podcast. I was like, oh, that's oh. awesome. I didn't even know that she means a lot. listened. It does. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. All right, everybody. Be the leader you're meant to be. We'll see you next week. The Dirty Side of Leadership podcast is brought to you by Forward Operations. If you'd like to book Ron or Kristen for speaking events, training, or executive coaching, visit forwardoperations.com. Be the leader you're meant to be.